series, two-part teaching on spiritual warfare. And uh, this morning I'm going to talk about strongholds, strongholds, and then uh, our text will be from 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And then next week I want us to look at the weapons of our warfare as outlined in the book of Ephesians. So before we begin, let's pray that God will give us wisdom. God will give me clarity as I teach and, and uh, uh, clarity as you folks listen. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your word. Um, it's, scripture says it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to divide and asunder of soul and spirit. So we help that you, we'd ask that you'd help us to distinguish uh, what is truth in our lives and what's not. And help us to understand what we're talking about when the Bible talks about strongholds. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, before we take a look at our biblical text from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, um, I want to say something very important here regarding spiritual warfare and if, there, if you get nothing else this morning, I would hope that you'd get what I share in the next few minutes. Although spiritual warfare is real, you realize it's real? Uh, and we can't ignore it. We, we need to be careful that the real, that, that we remember, we need to be careful to remember that the real battle with Satan listen to me now, was one at the cross and the resurrection. Okay. Books abound today on spiritual warfare that are wrapped up in saying that we need to do something to take on Satan, that we need to do it. No. No, we don't. We know we, we, we don't. Um, this same victorious Christ who, catch this now, single-handedly defeated the devil lives in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. You got that? So the, that one, capital O, that one who championed the victory on the cross of Calvary over Satan and rose back again from the dead. He resides in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. That's why John could say in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, greater is he that is what? In you than he that is in the world. Okay. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, our view of spiritual warfare must begin with this basic understanding of Jesus' already accomplished victory over Satan. Already accomplished. And if we don't start out with this as our foundation, eventually we will be led to utterly ridiculous spiritual conclusions. The victory has already won. It's already been won. And there is nothing that we can add. Get this now. There is nothing that we can add to the destructive work Jesus did to Satan's domain when he was raised from the dead. Absolutely nothing. It's finished. It's finished. The battle is over. Okay? It's finished, as Gaither's wrote. There will be no more war. It's finished. It's the end of the conflict. It's finished. And Jesus is Lord. It's done. It's done. And in Colossians 2.15, turn there if you'd like. Paul vividly uh, portrays Jesus' victory in Satan's defeat. Notice, 
Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Now, the word disarmed here refers to the act of stripping one's garments off to the point of complete nakedness. And by using the word disarmed, the Holy Spirit in his word tells us that when Jesus Christ came back from the dead, he thoroughly, thoroughly plundered the enemy. Quite literally, he disarmed principalities and powers. An even better translation could read, he completely stripped principalities and powers and left them utterly naked with nothing left at their disposal to retaliate. In the life of the believer, we need to realize that Satan has no power over us. He has no power over us. Okay? And then furthermore, here in this passage, Paul goes on to tell us that Jesus didn't stop when his mission was, was accomplished. Instead, let me, let me rephrase that. Furthermore, Paul goes on to tell us that, when, that Jesus didn't stop when his mission was accomplished and his sacking and plundering of hell's powers was complete. He didn't stop there. He didn't stop there. Instead, Jesus rubbed this defeat in the devil's face by throwing the biggest party the universe has ever seen. Okay? Colossians 2.15 continues. Listen to this. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. The King James Version in this verse says, he made a show of them openly. He made a show of them openly. Literally, to, to the, the word show her means to display or to expose something. And it was used in classical Greek writings of this day to denote the displeasure of, the, or the display of captives, uh, weaponry and trophies that were seized during war on, on foreign soil. And then once the war was over and the battle was won, the reigning emperor would return home and victoriously display, display and expose the treasures, the trophies, the weaponry, and captives he had seized during his military conquest. We alluded a little bit to this this morning in, uh, in the teaching we were doing on Second, Second Samuel. Uh, it goes out without saying that this was a grand moment of celebration for the victor uh, in the wars of that day and a very humility humiliating experience for the, for the, if you please, naked foe. Now, the Holy Spirit has carefully chosen to use the same word to let us know what Jesus did after he was finished plundering the enemy. And when his resurrection was complete and the enemy was stripped bare to the core, Jesus then proceeded to publicly display and expose this defeated spiritual foe and all his defective wares to the hosts of heaven. Here they are. But wait, that's not all. Paul goes on to tell us that here in Colossians 2.15, he made a show of them openly. And the word openly there is with boldness or confidence. So Paul declares that when this heavenly party or celebration, if you please, of Jesus' victory commenced, it was no quiet affair. I want you to picture that. No quiet affair. Quite the contrary. Jesus boldly, boldly, confidently, and loudly exposed and displays this now defunct foe to heaven's host. I've shared this before. I can't remember whether I've shared it here or not. The scripture says that, talking about the second coming of Jesus, the scripture says, for the Lord shall ascend with a shout, and the dead in Christ shall rise forth. Someone is 
jokingly said, and probably more true than fiction, is the fact that we're the dead in Christ are going to get at least a six-foot head start. <laughs> See? And so, so the dead in Christ will rise first. And then those of us who remain, remain alive, will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Now, here's an interesting thing. The scripture, one of the names that the scripture gives to Satan, our enemy, is the fact that he is the prince and power of what? The air. Where is Jesus going to put those who are still alive and caught up together to meet him in what? The air. And I think Jesus is going to confidently, boldly, and loudly proclaim before Satan, our enemy, na 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 I got him and you don't. See? And folks, I share with you with conviction and boldness this morning that Jesus has us and Satan doesn't. Okay? So that's our foundation for properly understanding spiritual warfare. Don't miss out on that. Don't miss out on that. If our understanding of spiritual warfare does not begin with this as our foundation, what I've just shared, we will, like I uh, uh, said earlier, we will eventually move into realms of teaching and experience that are not doctrinally correct. So we need to be careful. We need to be careful. All right. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Let me read this for you. <clears throat> Verses 3 through the first part of 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war according to the flesh. So help me out here. What, what do you think Paul is talking about when he refers to the flesh? Anybody care to feel that? Our sinful nature. Second Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. If you're writing stuff down, the flesh here is simply defined as the fallen, depraved nature with which we are born. Okay? We are born with this sinful nature. Paul, and, and there's no good in that nature. Paul said, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. See? So that's the status of that flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Now, pastor has emphasized sharing stuff in context. So the context here is, you know, we ask the question, why does Paul... Why is Paul saying this stuff? The thing is, Paul was under attack. He had, was going to try and visit the Corinthians. But stuff had, had hindered him from doing so. And they, they were saying, Paul, the reason that you're not coming is because you can't speak to us boldly like you do in your letters. You can write bold things to us and really get on to us. He'd already written to him what we know to be 1 Corinthians. There was probably one other, one other letter that he wrote that was either uh, meshed into 1 and 2 Corinthians or it's not part of the 
the inspired word. But at any rate, they said, you, you can rail on us when you're right, but, but uh, the reason you're not coming is because you can't do the same when you're here. You're not walking in the spirit, Paul. You're walking in the flesh. You're no better than us. Remember, you told us in 1 Corinthians that you're still acting like you're natural people. You're not saved. You need to grow up. And so they're accusing Paul of the same, some of the same things. So Paul says, he, he wants to refute that. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, same word, are not fleshly, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Okay? For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not, are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Now, I want to focus the next few minutes on, on this stronghold thing. And I want us to see what, what strongholds are and what causes them. And, and then next week, I want, to, I, want to, I want us to see what we need to do in order to pull them down. Paul says uh, our, the weapons of our warfare are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. So we're going to see that about that part next week. So what is a stronghold anyway? Well, the same definition that Webster gives in his, its dictionary is, has the same meaning as it does here. And it's a fortress or a high thing or a castle. <coughs> a castle. Let, me, let me read you a note from my study Bible here. It says, overlooking ancient Corinth, was a hill 1,857 feet high. And on top of it was a fortress. Paul used that imagery as an illustration of the spiritual warfare he raged. He was familiar with, with Corinth. He spent quite a bit of time there. He was familiar with that area. And so he, as he's writing to them, and he wants to talk about this thing of spiritual warfare, he says, the, the, the weapons that we have are not fleshly. They don't come out of our own making. They're mighty from God for the pulling down of strongholds. And when he, when he, he and it's like he, he thinks about this up on, up on this great hill, 1,800 plus feet high. You think, wow, yeah, there's a big castle up there, there's a, and it's a fortress around it, and there's, there's a, High, high places refers to some of the, the idols and everything like that. So, so then what are they? That's the definition of them. It's kind of a high place, a, a fortress, a castle. You got that picture in your mind? Okay. So what are some of these strongholds? Well, the strongholds represent the arguments the thoughts and plans that are contrary to and in opposition to the thoughts and plans that God has for us. We all have strongholds of one kind or another. We do. Okay? And we we need to be very we need to be very careful. So Help me out here. Mention some of those strongholds, whether they apply in your life or not. Alcohol. Alcohol. What? Alcohol. Addictions. I'm around that stuff every day. How they just, they have a hold on us. They just have a hold on us. What do you say? Grudges. Grudges. You know, most of the grudges that we hold, the people that we hold them against, they don't even know it. Yeah. 
David O. Pridefulness. Pride. Yes. One of the greatest sins that the Bible talks about. Okay. Okay. Did you catch me, anybody who's not in church today? Did you catch that? That not, not joining together with the brothers and sisters has the habit of some is, the scripture says in the book of Hebrews, it's a stronghold and a very strong stronghold. Greed. Give me an example. Taking the biggest piece of pie so someone else doesn't get it. <laughs> Diana. Yeah, the, anything that, that becomes a fortress in your life that is not God serving. There was another question. David. I had a good friend who at the time wasn't a believer. Later on, he became a believer. But back in the years, years ago, when the, the scandals hit the, hit the preachers like the Jim Bakers and the Jimmy Swaggerts and some of those, here, here, my friend made this observation. He says, here's the problem. And he said, greed. He says, their charisma got them there, and their greed kept them there. See? And a lot of times, different things get us to the point where something has a stronghold in our lives, and then we get, and then that stronghold keeps us there because it, it's just that stronghold. Perry, gossiping. gossiping, great sin. Yeah, gossiping. Pardon? Fear. 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 I used to have a fear of the dark. <laughs> and the fear of the dark. And the, the place where we lived at when I was growing up for most of my, a lot of my life, was between Myers Flat and, and uh, Fruitland Road. And at night when I'd come home from a ball game, I'd get off the bus and, I, oh, and I'd run up that road. It was difficult in the winter time because there were mud puddles. But I, I reached a point where I wouldn't step in more than one or two because I knew where they were and I'd just take off and fly. Here's the interesting thing. When I came to know Jesus, one of the first verses as I came that I came across after I trusted the Lord was perfect love casts out. And I thought, God, you love me perfectly, and I want to love you as perfectly as I know how because I want to get rid of fear of the dark. And God took that away in just a very short time. Never, more, never, never again did afraid of the dark. Strongholds, strongholds. And so what causes the, these emerging, the emerging of these strongholds? Here's, here's, 
Here's what you need to say. We do. Say that with me. We do. We cause the emerging of the strongholds. Now let me share this. Most of us have fallen under the foot of a stronghold. I mean, most of us who have fallen under the foot of a stronghold and probably touches all of us here, must admit that if we had not given Satan, our enemy, some kind of a foothold in our minds, we would not have fallen victim to a stronghold. See? Who said hoo hoo? See? See? Most of us who have fallen under the foot of a stronghold must admit that if we had not given Satan, our enemy, some kind of foothold in our minds, we would not have fallen victim to a stronghold. See, we don't realize how powerful Satan, our enemy, is. You've heard our pastor share time and time again he, he goes forth like a roaring lion to and fro in the earth, seeking whom he may devour. And the word devour there is the strongest word used for destroy or destruction in the Bible. He wants to destroy us. There are people in Southern Humboldt whose testimony for God, a stronghold of one kind, has destroyed their ministry. Sure, we can attach a lot of excuses to it. But you see, demon spirits are real. We don't hear that much about demonology today. And that's okay. If we hear it just once, it's enough. And it's true. And I think this is true. Demon spirits have absolutely no power to bring about destruction unless they find an open door into a person's mind. That's why in this passage, and we'll be talking more about this aspect of it next week, it says in, in verse 5, bringing every thought into con- captivity to the obedience of Christ. Paul shared with with the believers at Philippi, let this, what, mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Our mind can play tricks on us. Sometimes I wish I didn't have one. Sometimes my wife accuses me of (laughs) of losing it. And sometimes I wish that was the case. Because of the tricks Satan can play on our mind. Making us believe stuff that's not true. We come into church and if we have a a low esteem, a low value of ourselves, we see some people talking. Oh, I bet they're talking about me. And most of the time they're not. Most of the time, most of the time that the enemy, we think the enemy is playing with our mind. It's just that. He's playing with our mind. And once, he, he's a deceiver. Scripture says he de, he's a deceiver of the folks who believe. He wants to deceive us. But you see, and, and Satan has his emissaries, his helpers out there. See? And he transforms himself into an angel of light. And the scripture says, not only does he do that, but his helpers do it as well. And if, if these 
satanic forces, if these demonic forces can locate such an entrance into our minds from this lofty, lofty position of being uh, in, a, in a place of, of wanting to force a stronghold upon us. They can begin to introduce evil influences and launch their attacks upon us. And they do that. And they do that. The Holy Spirit's very faithful in, in to convict us of any areas in our lives that leave us vulnerable to Satan's attacks. When we get tired, we're vulnerable. Get stressed, we're vulnerable. Get busy, we're vulnerable. Okay. A lot of things can take place in our lives that make us vulnerable. That's why it's it's important to 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 get good rest. And even more so to rest in the Lord. To rest in the Lord. Uh, the Holy Spirit urges us to repent of certain things that are part of our lives and change, turn away before the devil builds a stronghold in our thinking. You got that? This is good stuff. This is stuff that, that we need to hear. However, it's still up to us to see that these open doors are slammed shut and forever closed. I'm shutting the door. The old Negro spiritual. Shut the door, keep out the devil. Shut the door, take the devil away. See? And we can do that. We just say, Turn Satan over to the Lord. Don't you try and fight him. Don't you try and fight him. Because you're going to lose. You're going to lose. So there's only one that fought him successful. Successfully, and he won. He won. Okay. So what happens if, if we ignore the Holy Spirit's urging? The Holy Spirit's conviction. What, what, what if we allow sin, uh, willfully permitted temptation, willfully permit temptation, or we, we permit wrong attitudes to persist in our lives, and our sin goes unconfessed, and therefore we go un, unchanged? In that case, we leave gaping holes through what's the enemy will seek to undo us. I don't want to be undone. Gosh, I don't want to be undone. Paul says in another, in another place, Paul says, I beat my body into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. He wasn't talking about losing his salvation. The word castaway simply means to be put on the shelf. See? Paul says, I don't want to be, I got work to do for God. I don't want to be put on the shelf. And I say the same, I don't want to be put on the shelf. I love doing this. There was a time when I didn't want to do it. God had to work in my heart, and our pastor has shared how he, he ran from pastoral ministry for 20 years. I didn't run from it quite that, that much, quite that long. But even a week is enough to run from God's call upon our lives. What stronghold? keeping you from doing what God wants you to do? Is it the stronghold of unbelief? 
And you say, I'm having a hard time believing this stuff about Jesus dying for me. Let me tell you what I share with the, the guys when I bring, <coughs> bring the message at the, at the mission. Here are guys who have been arrested for one offense or another. And when, uh, when I say, you having a hard time with belief? You having a hard time dealing with it? The salvation stuff, and then I, I usually holler. They think I'm nuts, but sometimes guys respond to it. I'll say, step away from the unbelief. <laughs> Up against the cross. All of you. I'll say that to you today. If you're here, you, you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. I say it in love. Get with it. Why carry around this stronghold of unbelief when at the close of this meeting today you can come right up here, stand or kneel at the altar, say, I want to come and know Jesus and be done with that stronghold forever. Give it a shot. What do you got to lose? Let me tell you what you got to lose. You got to lose is hell. Let me tell you what you got to gain. Heaven. Amen. You want to take your chances? Give it a shot. The truth is, folks, most strongholds and spiritual destruction is avoidable. Um, and the key is by simply paying close attention to the Word of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit and obeying the warnings that are given to us. It's full of warning. And again, demon spirits, satanic spirits, cannot get a stronghold on you and destroy you without an open door into your soul. And such an entrance can only be given by way of permission. And when we allow that stuff to take place, we, gave, we give the enemy permission. We just kind of open the door. Evil forces may try to buffet and hinder us as they tried to buffet and hinder the Apostle Paul. But they cannot destroy you or me unless there's something already wrong in us to which they can latch hold and then they can twist it to our destruction. I'm almost done. <clears throat> the tendency of the flesh Listen closely now. The tendency of our flesh has always been to blame personal failure on someone else or on some external circumstance that is beyond our control. In today's culture and terminology, we call it throwing people under the bus. And when I when I've diagnosed in, in my spirit, when I'm counseling somebody, when I diagnose in my spirit that <clears throat> there is sin, and then I begin to ask them questions that there's sin, you know, in a person's life as I'm counseling them, and I begin to ask them questions to, to, to draw them out, and they start throwing people underneath the bus. I think in my mind, here we go, back to Eden. Here we go, back to the garden. And the garden is in some pot farm in Humboldt County, the Garden of Eden. Remember, it was Adam, the natural father of us all, according to the scriptures, who shifted the blame for his own moral failure to Eve. 
rather than own up to it and say, yep, I, he committed a sin. I, I ate freely of the forbidden fruit of the garden. What did Adam tell God? The woman you gave me. The woman whom thou gave to me with, to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And who'd the woman blame? She, she blamed the serpent. She, she blamed the most beautiful creature in the field before it was a serpent. Likewise, a Christian is shifting blame that rightfully belongs to him when he says, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. And folks, regardless of how many dim, demon spirits have been assigned to destroy a believer? That person, let's put our own names in there. I, I must cooperate with the enemy's suggestion before temptation can overtake me and ruin my witness. And I don't want my witness to be ruined. So like I said earlier, this means that ultimately we're responsible for our own failure or success in obeying God in this life. Scripture says, for we shall all give account of ourselves, ourselves to God. You, you, can't, you can't shift the blame to anyone else. And you can't even shift the blame for your failure to demon activity or to Satan. Why? Because the Bible says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And God wants to shortstop us when we start blaming. God wants to shortstop us. And he says, hey, I'm greater than who you're about ready to throw underneath the bus. Take responsibility for this. You say, well, who's going to take responsibility for me? God says, I am. Oh, I already did on a place called Calvary. On a spot called Golgotha. On a cross. Died for you. So what do we need to do in order to pull down these strongholds? Well, Paul says that the weapons of our warfare, warfare are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, for demolishing strongholds. In the scripture in Ephesians chapter 6, that the armor of God contains our weapons of our warfare. Ephesians chapter 6. Read it. if you. Would. It's the last, last part. A lot of things are in Ephesians chapter 6. Last chapter of the book, the book of Ephesians. So read that in preparation for next week. And so Next week, we'll, we'll talk about it. I would encourage you, don't miss it. Don't miss it. And uh, not because I'm such a great teacher or preacher, but because what I'm sharing with you is based on what the Bible says. Based upon what the Bible I'm trying to tell you what the Bible says. Resist. Don't take him on. Folks, don't take on the devil. Michael the archangel. He wouldn't even take on the devil. The scripture says he committed his problems with the devil. He committed him to the one who could whip him. And his name's Jesus. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. His name is Jesus, 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 Jesus. And he's the king. And he is the destroyer of our enemy, Satan. He already won it, won the victory at the cross, at the cross. And if you had been the only person, listen to me now, especially any of you here this morning, you don't know Jesus. If you were the only person at the foot of the cross 
when Jesus died, he was dying for you. Let's pray. Lord, work in hearts in these closing moments. You probably already started as we've shared the inspired word. I trust that we've made it clear. I trust that it's been clear enough that everyone here is able to understand it. And so, Lord, I just ask that you would help us to respond accordingly. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to close, and I want us to sing. I hadn't planned to do this, but I want us to sing. This is a song that was sung the night I came to know Christ. I think most of you know it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Um, what number is it? It's in the 300s, I think. 340. Very simple chorus written many, many years ago by a lady. When I get to heaven, I want to go up to her and I says, I want to tell her thank you for, for writing that song, that little chorus. It goes like this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Here's the interesting thing, folks. The strongholds that enter into our lives what they do is they their goal is to make the things of the Lord grow dim in our minds and our hearts whereas when we want it when we turn our life and our turn our eyes upon Jesus like the song says and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. The things of the flesh grow strangely dim in the light. Scripture says the entrance of your word brings light. Let's sing that again. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Lord, take that which we've taken into our minds and our hearts today Use it for your glory, for the expressed purpose of having the things of this earth grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and your grace. In Jesus' name, the folks said, Amen. Amen. I'm done.